we are spinning on a planet. This is fleeting. And when I meet somebody who I want to immediately judge, there's a part of me that wants to go up to them and say, hey man, you're gonna die. <laughs> you're going to die. We're all gonna die. And your legacy is that you were a douchebag. <laughs> That's your legacy. What a, what a bummer. And the thing is, you actually can make today a different choice to start treating people differently. And you can change your legacy. You can change your legacy. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Maya Bialik's breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. We started using Athletic Greens when we learned about how little work you had to do to get so many vitamins and minerals. One delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, and I was convinced. It's 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. It's also lifestyle-friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it has less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no chemicals, no artificial anything, and it still tastes good. Right now, reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially as we're in flu and cold season. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. No need for a million different pills and supplements. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash breakdown. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Today we're going to be breaking down asthma. You might be thinking asthma, that's a weird thing to break down. But we're going to be talking to two-time Emmy Award winning actor, producer, and author Tony Hale. You might know him from his role as Buster Bluth on Arrested Development, um, or the two Emmys that he's won for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series came for playing uh, Gary Walsh, the personal aide to Julia Louis-Dreyfus's character on Veep. But before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge the absence <laughs> of Jonathan. It's funny because Tony Hale's character is described as the downtrodden personal aide. I don't think of Jonathan as a downtrodden personal aide, but he sometimes is a downtrodden because of me co-host. Jonathan is not here, but he will be back. Tony Hale has such an interesting journey. He was an army brat till he was in seventh grade. Um, and his asthma is something that followed him his entire life and kind of is still part of his life. And we're gonna be talking about the impact of having a chronic condition, one that's often invisible to other people and how that kind of shifted his perspective and his anxiety. And he talks about panic attacks that often accompany uh, asthma attacks, really, really fascinating stuff about kind of the immune system and, and what those kind of chronic conditions can do to our mental health. Um, but we also talk about so many other things. I can't say enough about how incredible this is um, to talk to Tony Hale this way. He plays the bad guy in Clifford the Big Red Dog, if you didn't know that. Um, he's also going to be in Being the Ricardos, which is the um, Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz movie starring Nicole Kidman, uh, Javier Bardem, and J.K. Simmons. And he has a series that he works on called The Mysterious Benedict Society. He plays two roles, Mr. Benedict and Mr. Curtin. And he's going to talk a bit about sort of the motivation for for that role in particular, um, as well as the, the children's book that he wrote, which then was turned into a Netflix series, which is called Archibald's Next Big Thing. Um, that was his book that he wrote in 2014. He's a father. He's a person of faith. And we, we talk about that. Um, he has so many good things that I want to take with me all the time. And I think you will really, really enjoy and get a lot from talking to Tony Hale. Let us welcome Tony Hale. Break it down. Tony Hale, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me. I, I usually have a sidekick. He is not here. But um, he will be very sorry that he missed today because Aww. he's <laughs> severely asthmatic. 
And oh, great. Yeah, we love we love to well, we we love when we have ailments that our guests share. It makes yeah. us feel not alone. It gives a good starting place. Yeah, you're in the same tribe. That's right. It is the the tribe of asthma. But before we get to that, many people know you from from Veep. You you have a an exciting career even before, during, after. Um, but many people know you from Veep. Tell us a little bit about sort of when you started acting, how you kind of got to the acting world where a lot of people know you. Well, really it was before, I would say, I did Arrested Development. Mm -hmm. I was living in New York. I moved to New York in 1995. Uh, my first acting gig was Shakespeare in the Parking Lot, <laughs> where we did, we, did Shake, we did Tame Me the Shrew in a parking lot in the East Village. Um, I started doing commercials. Well, actually, I take that back. I, I had a lot of odd jobs. I was cater waitering. I liked cater waitering because I hated waiting tables. But with cater waiting, you didn't have to deal with people. You could just put the food down, and if they had attitude, you're like, that's what you're gonna get. And so I really liked that. And then, and then I started. I started. I went to this. Okay, I went to this thing called Actors Connection, where you pay money to meet agents. And so I had met all these agents, and this one lady named Linda McIntosh. Uh, took some interest in me and because she described me as <laughs> David Schwimmer, but not as good looking. And <laughs> that's what they like, say oh about me God. too, which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what if somebody doesn't think David Schwimmer is good? Then I'm really screwed. With <laughs> um, so then I started going out as that type, like not all there, quirky. And I started booking commercials, but it took me, I'd say six years to find an agent to send me out for TV and film. Uh, because no one really saw me beyond the commercial world. And I finally found this manager. And then a year later, the audition for Arrested Development came around, who was a character that was not all there, because that's what the agents kind of knew me as. And I put myself on tape, and um, I I'd met my wife, and then we were engaged. And 10 days before I got married, the show got picked up. Wow. And I was like, I think we're moving to LA and she was a makeup artist on SNL at the time, hmm. which she loved. So she made a big sacrifice for us to move out to LA. And so then I just started working out here and then the rest of it got canceled. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's a roller coaster. You, you, <laughs> this business, you sign up for a life of rejection. Like it is, it is just always putting yourself out there. And after arrested, I was kind of, you know, I was kind of seen as that character hmm. and it's not like someone was going to be looking for a, an actor to play a lawyer in a film and be like, you know what? That guy who was on Arrested Development playing Buster Blue, he's, he's our guy. Um, so I had to kind of, you know, put myself out there and show other stuff. And then Beep came around and he was another kind of beaten down character, but in a different form and, and just kind of gig to gig, really gig to gig. And you, um, you have an interesting early life. You were an army brat, right? Until basically middle school. You were born in West Point. Um, yeah. And your your mom was in politics, interestingly, and your father taught in nuclear and atomic physics. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And he was he was in the military, correct? He was in the military. He he uh, went to Vietnam and and um, and he studied um, he studied a nuclear physics at West Point, and then he taught it at West Point. Um, so he's incredible. <laughs> he's a very smart man. And I'm sure he's he, a real yeah. hoot at cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. He, um, he, my my grandfather was an opera singer. My grandfather was in vaudeville in New York. He was one of the hosts of the Earl Carroll Follies, and then he also would do club singing and opera singing and all these kind of odd gigs. And so my dad had a real appreciation for the arts and you know education and, and all those things. And so he really he really backed my career which you know is obviously not always the case and in the seventh grade when we were when he retired from the from the military we moved to tallahassee florida and i was uh my brother was really into sports and i was not and in the in the south like if you're not into sports you don't exist you know it's just like football's a religion so i didn't they didn't really know what to do with me and so they kind of think by the grace of god they found this um little theater called Young Actors Theater and signed me up for it. And I just kind of found my people and loved it. And that's where I kind of started acting. So before then you weren't into sports, but like what, what kind of, what kind of kid was Tony Hale? Like were, were you naturally funny? 
Um, I would say I was naturally, <laughs> well, keep in mind, sixth grade down is just, I don't know about you, but sixth grade down is a blur. I, I don't know. I don't know if I was like had severe trauma. I don't know. I mean, like, I was going to say, that's my first guess, but I don't want to go there if you're not like, ready. I don't know. I don't know. I have been to many therapists and we have <laughs> dug deep, but I just do not remember sixth grade down much. Mm -hmm. So I think I was, I think I was a very, um, without using the word, Spaz, I, I had a lot of energy. Got it. You know, and it was like just not knowing what to do with that energy. And um, I think, and also, honestly, I was, I, I do remember in middle school, I was bullied pretty bad because I mean, I was, I was a sensitive, creative kid that didn't fit the kind of Southern right. sports mold. And so I was bullied. And I think <clears throat> as hard as that was, because some of the bullying went into high school. As hard as that was, that kind of develops a sense of humor. Like you're either you're either going to laugh it off, laugh with them, um, make a joke to yourself when they bully you. Like, well, oh, that wasn't very nice. And you'll say, call them something in your mind. That you kind of develop this comedic defense system, you know. And I think that kind of formed from there. My MB Alex breakdown is supported by BetterHelp Online Therapy. We talk a lot about the stigma surrounding mental health and BetterHelp is one of the things that we get to talk about that is an active thing you can do to kind of fight those stigmas that many of us have. Many of us think things have to get really, really bad before we'll make a change in our life. That's not true. I was having a conversation with a friend and his partner had gone through something really traumatic and basically is too nervous to go and address it because it feels like it's overwhelming and isn't aware of how that is potentially still alive. A lot of things, they have an impact. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you, but BetterHelp is the kind of place that is encouraging you to sign up, find someone you can talk to, and start working through some of these things, and we are pretty sure your life will Get better. BetterHelp is online therapy. They have video, phone, and live chat sessions. You don't have to turn on your camera if you're not ready to. Also, it's much more affordable than in-person therapy. You can be matched with someone in under 48 hours. See why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. Our listeners get 10% off their first month. Go to betterhelp.com slash break. That's betterhelp.com slash break. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Vegamore. This is hard to talk about. Because it is not a glamorous thing to say that my hair is thinner than I want it to be. I have discovered Vegamore and I am super, super into their products. Vegamore is a transformative, 100% vegan, clean, holistic company that leverages smart botanicals clinically proven to promote visibly thicker, fuller, longer looking hair. They have a GRO Grow Revitalizing Shampoo and Conditioner Kit and Grow Serum that work together to create visibly thicker hair and improve hair from the roots. 91% of customers say they saw visibly thicker hair with Vegamore in just three months of use. I'm about a month in, so I'll, I'll keep checking in, but I love it. Start your journey to longer, fuller looking hair. Go to vegamore.com slash break and use code break to save 20% on your first order. That's V-E-G-A-M-O-U-R dot com slash break. Code break to save 20% at vegamore.com slash break. So speaking of um, defense systems, when did you first... Um, when did you first present with symptoms of asthma? Ever since I was, uh, I can remember, which is obviously not I was going to say, sixth grade down, we have no idea. Sixth grade down is a blur. But through pictures and like, you know, we would go on trips and my mom would say, oh yeah, that was the trip that we had to take you to the hospital, hospital because you were having an asthma attack. And I was, you know, inhalers were like my baby blanket. Like it was just like, I was always, always had an inhaler attached to me. So ever since I was little, it was always kind of a, just a, almost a partner that you like an obnoxious partner that you learned how to deal with. Did your you know? brother have asthma or as the athletic no. one, he did not got it. <laughs> he did not. No. <laughs> can you do us, you know, do us a solid here. C can you describe, let's say someone doesn't know what asthma is. Um, and obviously there's, there's different kinds, but can you describe sort of what asthma is? Ooh. Um, what is asthma? Um, I guess what I can describe what people would probably connect with the most is the feeling of it it's as though 
something that we take, obviously all take for granted, just kind of going, it's like somebody just coming away and taking your life source away. All of a sudden your chest, where usually you have this, you know, opening where you have free breathing and you feel confident in that. It's like somebody, it's like all of a sudden you're breathing through a straw and there's a restriction that happens in your chest that it's like, you just feel like, Am I going to die? I can't, I'm not getting my life source. And when you're a kid and it's all you've known, you get very kind of used to it, but it doesn't mean it's scary. But I remember driving to the hospital with my mom and like trying to push up my body in hopes of kind of creating a longer opening to kind of get air up. And then, you know, typically hospitals are terrifying for kids. They were just like an oasis for me because that when that needle, when that shot hit my arm, I could breathe again. So it was just like, I couldn't wait to get that shot, you know, through my body. So it's a, it's a terrifying, I'm actually working now with um, uh, AstraZeneca on this campaign for it's this, um, this kind of certain kind of asthma that might be inside your body called eosinophils and you get this blood test. That's, it's not really, I always thought asthma was outside your body. This is something inside your body, but I've loved connecting with other asthmatics because we just like you said, like your, your your friend that you do your podcast with, there is an immediate understanding of, yeah, you know what it feels like. You know, you you know what when somebody says it, people just like associate. Yeah, I'm always going to be able to breathe. When you really think I'm, I might not be able to breathe tonight. It is like it's immediate terror. Well, and it's not just my my. It's not just Jonathan. Um, I I also have asthma, and also I'm oh. a, I'm a highly allergic person, and I'm an anaphylactic, you know, risk. Like I'm oh, all gosh. I'm all the no. I mean I'm I'm all the goodies. You know, Eastern European Jews, we just get it all. <laughs> a lot of Congratulations. Um, yeah. So. Um, you know, the, the thing that and, and I did not have severe asthma as a child. You know, I had I had all those kind of like early precursor things that when I was finally diagnosed as an adult, because sometimes it will present after a case of bronchitis, you know, I was like, oh, that's why I could make that weird whistling sound sometimes, you know? And yeah, you know, yeah. there's that it's like I would whistle and I remember I would like show my friends, like, listen, and it's like, anyway, it was I was a strange child. But um, I do remember that one of our closest family friends, the older daughter in that family had asthma and she was always in and out of the hospital. And it was terrifying. And I think this is something that people, and this is kind of what, why I was really eager to talk to you is, you know, this is one of those things that um, a lot of people don't understand these kind of conditions because they're, they're virtually invisible. You know, obviously you can mm. see someone freaking out, but I will say that, Having an, an asthma attack, it can look like a panic attack because you yeah. think you're going to die. It feels like you cannot breathe. And I remember the first time I was given um, an inhaler, there was a I was given like the regular one that I had to use all the time. And then I was given the, quote, emergency inhaler. And I was given specific instructions. Do not use this after 3 p.m. And I was like, F that. What does that mean? And sure enough, if you use that thing after 3 p.m., you will not go to sleep. It's like yeah, yeah. being on speed. But yeah. the first time that I used it, it was like I had lungs. And my mm. whole existence had been operating with no lungs. I mean, I know as a scientist, that's not even doesn't make sense, but that's what it felt like. It, you feel it. And with that emergency inhaler, it hits your body and you all of a sudden have more breath, more air. You don't feel, you said restricted. It's like a restriction and a constriction. But what I wanted to sort of um, have you highlight, and you know, I don't know if you had a conscious experience of this, but when you have that kind of you know condition that that you you know live with, there's a there's sort of an underlying baseline of anxiety that has oh, yeah. to exist because you're operating at a level of vigilance that, again, mm -hmm. it's an invisible thing. Like, people would say, like, oh, just get over it. Like, take some water. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time somebody's like, just breathe better. Like, you know, walk it off. But the the kind of built-in anxiety, and especially for children, it can be really terrifying to always be kind of, I mean, I read a quote of yours, you know, kind of like, where's the closest hospital? But in your mind, like, you carry that with you all the time. For people who have Crohn's, you hear a lot of similar descriptions of like, people can't tell what's going on, or even, you know, all sort of colitis, or all those kind of, people can't tell what's going on, but your internal state is one of constant vigilance. Do, do you remember 
feeling that or is it something you more reflect on as an adult? Oh yeah, I don't, I, it's, it's so funny. I mean, even hearing you say that I resonate with everything. It's all I've known. I was doing a show years and years ago and I, they said it was going to be, I don't know, somehow I didn't connect the dots when I was reading the script, but it was shot in a horse barn. <laughs> and I have a terrible allergy to horses. Yeah. And um, I, but I don't know. I just, you know, maybe it was a typical actor thing. It was like, I want the job. I can Claritin it up. I don't know. Like maybe the horses aren't there. I just, you know, stupidly rationalize in my Did head. Did you just say maybe the horses aren't there? <laughs> yeah. Cause it, maybe it was the barn and the horses okay. weren't there. I, I was just kind I'm of a dumb, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Again, actor brain. <laughs> so I, um, I get there and obviously I have an attack and for another stupid thing, for some reason I didn't have my inhaler and I always have my inhaler. I went to a function last night and the first thing I think is I got to get my inhaler. I, which pocket do I want to put the inhaler in? That's, that's the first thing. I, whenever I travel, it's like, where do I put the inhaler? And I didn't have my inhaler. And when, when I tell you there was, I started breathing bad and somebody in the crew had an inhaler and it was like an angel just parted the crowd. It was, it was a lifeline. That inhaler became a lifeline. I know that I can breathe through that inhaler. And it's like, there's just a very Pavlovian thing with that inhaler for me. And you mentioned anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> when I was in high school, I was doing the show Little Abner. And I was marrying Sam. And I, I had to sing a solo. And I was very nervous about singing the solo. And I was having some kind of asthma issues, but it was also mixed with anxiety. And back then, no one really talked about panic attacks. And I got this really weird connection between my asthma and panic. I always had it, but like, um, I never had a panic attack. Well, anyways, I had a mixture where I was breathing a little weird and then I had a mm -hmm. panic attack, but I didn't know what a panic attack was. And I was like, oh, it was just, and I started using my inhaler and it wasn't working. Oh. And so then you're just like, then you start panic even more. And you're like, wait, if my inhaler's not working, I can't, what is this? What is this? And no one's talking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, then since then, well, since then, there was a real kind of um, uh, strong, the, the anxiety got stronger and stronger with my asthma. Like, is there a hospital nearby? And this is when I was in college. I remember being on a trip going um, on some retreat and I was in a bus. And even I had my inhaler with me. I had this thought that we're going up a mountain. If I have an asthma attack, I can't get to a hospital. I had a panic attack. The sweating where you're just like, I can't get off the bus. And so then, you know, by the grace of God, like worked on a lot of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, all that stuff. But of course, I mean, I mean, it makes so much sense. Like that anxiety is associated with asthma. Working with AstraZeneca, these people, it's like, I love talking about that. I'm like, guys, yes, about the restriction of the breathing. Yes, about the inhaler. But let's talk about the anxiety that's associated with it. You're, you're telling, people are telling you that they're feeling like their life source is being taken away from them and they don't know when. The uncertainty of when it can come like that. That is so much anxiety. I'm also wondering, I, I had a friend when I was young, uh, when I was young, I had a friend in elementary school and, and junior high and she was epileptic. And this was oh at a time gosh. when like no one, like we barely knew what it was. Like the medication that they had to put this poor child on was so heavy and it was so sedating and it was like a whole thing. And when we would go to like, you know, our weekends of like synagogue, we would go to, you know, little camp weekends in Malibu, whatever. And like, she had to like go to the nurse and it was like a big deal to take her medicine. And I remember it was like, um, you know, there was a certain combination of kind of her being embarrassed and also kind of, having to turn that into sort of being excited by the attention because like there was no way to kind of like make it make sense because she didn't just want to be like oh poor me so it was kind of like it just sort of became like oh going to you know and she would kind of over talk about it mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you resonate kind of with either of those you know of like because you know I'm thinking of people who might be listening or people who have you know younger kids like do you have any memories specifically, you know, of feeling embarrassed or situations that, you know, kind of were hard where you had to sort of summon, you know, some other strength to kind of get through? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, I've never thought about it that way, but that's a really interesting thought because, I mean, I remember sleeping over people's houses, you know, spend the night and having an asthma attack and mom and dad having to come pick me up because, you know, I, I was the one that was sitting, <laughs> sitting up straight at the wall trying to breathe and everybody else is asleep and I'm like I'm wheezing can you come get me and then like why are you leaving I mean all that kind of embarrassment 
But to your point, I never thought about that. Like that might have transitioned and just kind of making a joke out of it, you know? And because you honestly, you always see those characteristics of like the nerd kid always has the inhaler you know and it's just like oh funny funny him I mean the guy with the big glasses of course he's got the inhaler there's and it's like you wonder if that comes from that's a tremendous fear and you're gonna kind of make a joke out of it yeah guys I gotta get my inhaler yeah here I go again the nerd doing that and then then you become the clown the you know it's that kind of might have formed out of that that's a really interesting thought and when if you don't mind me asking when did you get into therapy? Oh, I love talking about therapy. Um, I got into it, <clears throat> well, I've probably, I've been off and on for probably since, mm, probably since like the mid nineties. But I would say when I was on Arrested Development, that was my dream. Getting a sitcom was my dream. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was in New York, I liked New York, but I was like, God, if I can just get an agent, if I can just get a sitcom, this will make, and then I got, I not, I only not, I not only got a sitcom, but I got a sitcom with amazing writing, mm -hmm. amazing actors, just a fantastic opportunity. And I found myself it not satisfying the way I thought it was going to satisfy mm -hmm. me. And it really freaked me out because I had given this a lot of weight. Um, and I really woke, it was after Wrestle was finished and we were canceled. Um, the same month that I had my daughter, the show was canceled. We bought a house and I was like, oh shit, what's going on? And I realized that most of my life I had not been very present. And to the point where I think that's where my memory is shot. I was just not a very, I was just not a very present person, even in New York, not very present, always looking ahead, always dreaming, which is not a bad thing, but always kind of checked out. And it's that whole thing. If you're not practicing contentment where you are, you're not going to be content when you get what you want. Mm. Can you say that again? If you're not practicing, con if you're not practicing content contentment where you are, you're not going to be content when you get what you want. Wow. And I feel like I, I got what I want, but since I had just not been practicing being present and like, and I'm not saying you're going to love your life all the time, but finding moments of contentment, moments of satisfaction, then it's not going to happen when you get that big thing. And so, once Arrested finished, I just had this kind of crisis where I was like, and anyways, that's where a lot of this children's book that I created came up with in the show about Archibald's next big thing about not looking to the next thing and missing where you are. And I love that when something came up that you kind of felt the need to sort of work on, this sounds like a very me thing, which is why it's like you spot it, you got it. You're like, I'm going to work on this and then create a tremendous amount of work and labor and creative energy around it. I will write a series of books about what I just paid therapists to help me with. I know. I'm going to make this work for me. <laughs> um, but it was, um, but it was also just like such a, and you've had these two where you're just like this moment of, wow, this is such, um, this seems so obvious to try to be present, but I suck at it. I'm mm -hmm. such shit at it. You know, I'm just not good at it. And so that's where that came from. So just through therapy, talking about that, but then out of therapy became a lot of, um, talking about anxiety. And I really, I really felt that I, at that point, I still every now and then, I felt more like a, a victim to my thoughts and my feelings, where I was just like, overwhelmed, you know, where you're just like, tons of feelings, tons of thoughts, tons of what ifs, tons of, I've lived in what if my entire life with asthma? What if I'm there and I don't have an inhaler? What if this happens? What if I don't get a job? What? And it's like, you just kind of felt overwhelmed by, or I did. And that's when I started getting into kind of cognitive behavioral therapy, where you, where I learned to try to step outside myself and become more of an observer of my thoughts and my feelings, rather than, um, rather than identifying with everything that comes my way. So, I mean, that's, that's also one of the most powerful messages of, of meditation, um, is the notion of kind of, you know, the, the, the visualization I have, especially when I'm trying to meditate, but like my mind is racing. I picture myself laying like, I know this might sound weird. Well, you know, I picture myself laying in a stream, like, like with my, you know, back on like pretty rocks. It's not cold. It's not uncomfortable. There's nothing weird. And I picture the thoughts going over me. Mm. And this was actually suggested to me by a musician friend of mine that there's only so many notes, because I'm a, a musician as well, that there's only so many notes, right? They can only go together in so many permutations. 
picture the notes just like floating over you and just pull what you need to write a song. And I was like, ooh, what a cool visual. But I started applying it to, to kind of meditation in that when I can't stop, like just let the thoughts go, right? You don't attach to them, you just let them kind of flow over you. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Manscaped. You know, Jonathan, Valentine's Day is coming. Yeah, it is. We know just the gift to give to that special someone for any and all special occasions. This Valentine's Day, it's time to give him a gift that four million men worldwide trust from Manscaped, the leaders in... Below the Waist Grooming. Use our exclusive offer, go to manscaped.com and use the code MIME for 20% off and free shipping. Jonathan, do you love Manscaped products? They have a fantastic no nick device that allows you to do everything you need to do without worrying that you're going to injure yourself. It is a great product. It also has a little light. Go to manscaped.com for our exclusive offer of 20% off and free shipping with the code M-A-Y-I-M. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code MIME at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code MIME. Give his Cupid an arrow from Manscaped this Valentine's Day. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Native. For most people, the new year means rethinking how they take care of themselves. Native makes it easy to switch to a personal care brand that makes all their products with simple ingredients. It's really important for people like me and many like me to have a deodorant that's aluminum free. That's one of my favorite things about the Native deodorant. Native cares about the products you put on your body. They're all about stopping the stink the right way. That's the Native difference. Native's coconut and vanilla scented aluminum free deodorant has been a customer favorite for years. And now Native's on a mission to overhaul your entire hygiene routine. They create products that are made with simple ingredients like shea butter and coconut oil. You can smell great all day long. Native deodorant checks a lot of boxes. Aluminum free, 24 hour odor protection, zero residue on skin application, and over 10 cents to choose from. Now's the time to treat yourself with Native. This year, up your personal hygiene routine with Native. Go to nativedeo.com slash break. Use promo code break at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash break and use promo code break at checkout for 20% off your first order. I also want to ask, you're a person of faith, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny because, I mean, I, I grew up with a religious tradition that I, you know, still continue to hold and, and practice. And, you know, my observance shifts, but kind of the universe doesn't. So, you know, it's more about like the human experience of, of religion is not God. That's the human experience of religion. But... You know, for me, the universe exists the same way it always has and always will. And anyway, um, you know, even with all of that training and even with all of that devotion and even with all of my observance, like simple things like this never made their way into my kind of religious practice. But once I sort of learned it from therapy and from meditation and some more of those kind of Eastern, you know, practices, what I've found is that I'm able to then incorporate my faith and my notion of, you know, kind of where I came from religiously into that sort of worldview. And it feels like a coalescence. I don't know if you resonate with that because, you know, I, I'm very interested. You know, you've been very active, you know, in, in your faith in a way that a lot of people in, in Hollywood, we, we don't tend to talk about it a lot. Um, but I'm, I'm curious where kind of your religious faith, you know, feels like it fits in to, you know, your therapy life and your kind of cognitive life. Yeah. Oh, that's a big question. I, um, you know, when you were talking about laying in the river or laying, you know, and letting the thoughts come over you, there's a practice that I do where um, I think about if I'm on a raft and I'm on a river and many times because of control or anxiety, I want to grab the sides. Mm. I just want to grab the sides and control and just try to control my narrative or control whatever. And I, I just constantly say to myself, say, trust the river, just trust the river because the river is for you. And because many times I feel like the river is against me, like things are against me. It's like, no, trust the river, it's, it's for you. And that is how I really have grown to just more and more see God, that he really is for me. And there's something about, you know, when it comes to faith, I don't know if you've ever gotten this, but people look at faith as a crutch. You know, they say, well, it's kind of a crutch, you know, you can do it yourself and stuff. And I'm like, 
God, life is hard, man. Let, give me two crutches. We're not, we're not, I don't want to do this by myself. You know, having, for me, having the guidance of a loving God to stand with me and assure me and having the, having the peace and the support, um, and also having, um, releasing to a higher power of things that I don't get because for some stupid ass reason, people in the faith world, at least in the Christian world, I can speak of, feel like they need to have all the answers and they need to have like the pretty, <laughs> the pretty get the package with a pretty bow on it. And like, this is what you need to do to, it's like, no, we are spinning on a planet. <laughs> there is so much uncertainty. There are so many questions I have, but the surrender to the higher power God for me, that surrender of saying, I don't know. I don't know, and I'm going to trust that you know, and I'm going to trust your path, and I'm just going to keep walking. And seeing the manifestation of that spirit within me and what I get from that is that's what just keeps me close to God, definitely. That's beautiful. So so well said. Um, were you raised in in the like? Were you raised religious, or is this something that you kind of took on later in life? Well, we kind of jumped around. I was raised Lutheran, and then we went to the South and the Southern Baptist. And yeah, and, uh, and I, you know, it's very easy for me to, <laughs> to bash kind of those experiences. But the, I think the older I get, the more I look at, yeah, it's, you know, that world was very much about do's and don'ts. And it was very, it kind of was a formula rather than a relationship with God. And, um, I, yeah, it's, it's easy for me, but it's like, you know what, that kind of, I'm thankful for that somewhat foundational things that I learned. And to your point of when you were laying on the water and you grab stuff in the air, I feel like God used that. Cause I, the things that I grabbed, I still have with me and then I left the rest, <laughs> you know, this is a, I mean, I hope you're not insulted by this question, but I am no, curious. Please. And if you don't like it, you don't have to answer. How do you reconcile um, your challenges, specifically your, let's say your asthma, with kind of your your God concept? Sure. You know, um, it's. I mean, asthma is the smallest thing, you know, compared to the suffering and things that people go through. I mean, it's ugh, my friend just got back from um, Africa dealing with um children who were uh trafficked 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 and you're just like what <laughs> you know i don't and again that's where i i have so many questions i have so many questions i do think the i don't want to get too not to get too meta but it's like um i kind of see love to have love, you have to have, you have, for instance, if I, if I'm married to someone, but I made that person marry me and I said, you're going to be marrying me, you're going to be with me. That's not real love. Cause that person deserves, if that person chooses me, then that's love. And I, I feel like God is a God of love and God is a God of health and healing. And I don't feel like, I feel like the human race has made some shitty ass choices. And unfortunately, over generations and generations and generations, just horrific stuff has happened. And God's intervention to that, um, I love when Mr. Rogers says there's always helpers. I don't see the bigger picture. I do think there are always helpers. And I do think God intervenes in ways that I'm not going to even know until, you know, I see it one day and see that big picture. And I really do believe he does. But all that crap of the choices and just leaning. I do think there's evil and leaning towards evil. Um, it's, I don't understand it, but I think it's just like, it's like a snowball that sometimes you're just like, holy shit, this is so out of control sometimes. I don't know if that makes sense. No, that, that it sense. does. It, it does make sense. I have a 16 year old and I have a 13 year old. So I have a 15 year old. We're, we're, we're in that teenage stage. What are you like as a dad? <laughs> what if I was like amazing? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> um, it is a, it's a, it is a. I hope I'm a. I, I, I really hope. Uh, I hope I'm a good one. I mean, I, 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 I love, I love my daughter as you love your kids. Like it's, it's. I've never known a love like, <laughs> like with a human being like this, where you're just like 
huh. Um, but, um, you know, I, I make mistakes. I like, you know, I say, I remember talking to a friend of mine who's a parent recently and just like, the power of when you make a mistake, just saying, Hey, I'm really sorry. Mm. I'm sorry. I said it that way. That was stupid. Um, cause there've been times my daughter's like, Hey, will you just listen and not try to give me an answer? <laughs> you know, cause all I want to do, there's something called, have you heard of snowplow parenting? <laughs> no. Where it's like, you know, obviously we've all heard of helicopter parenting where it's like you hover too much, but there's this new term called snowplow parenting where all you, you just want to take all the challenges away. In oh front of them. yeah. Like you if wanna... they leave their violin. Yeah, just you let just, them exactly. not have the violin for that day. Exactly. <laughs> Instead of but all to I want to do and, is yeah. bring that. I want to bring that violin to them because I don't want her to face that challenge. And it's like I have to let her make her mistakes. I have to let her face those challenges. But you know, I want to give her the answer. I'm like, well, I've got the formula. If you do this and this. Also, you're a dude. Sometimes dudes just have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and we're right. We're right. Um, but it's like just being able to say, I'm sorry. I'm really mm-hmm. sorry that I should have just listened and just let you, you know, vent and, and leave it at that. That's okay. You know, it's okay to sit, it's okay to sit in that space. Were you raised like that? Cause Jonathan and I talk a lot about how like my parents were never wrong. I'm a hundred percent certain that like, that was the way like post world war two people were taught, yeah. like just like my parents were born during world war two. And, um, my grand, my grandparents were immigrants from Eastern Europe, just in the pogroms leading up to the Holocaust. So like we had that whole thing, but it was like, you know, I, I don't remember my mom, like ever playing a game with us. Do you know what I mean? Like she was always in the kitchen. She was always cleaning. Like even when she was working at a preschool, she also was like breakfast was on the table before my dad was a teacher, before we all went to school. Like that woman freaking did everything, but she was also like always right. Like they were always right. And it's been so, imp- and they did the best they could, you know, sure, for course, that era. But one of the most empowering things, this is when I talk to, you know, people who are just starting to have like the discipline conversations with their five-year-old or however old, you know, I always say kids love to hear that you messed up. Meaning it is such an important thing. It doesn't make you less powerful. It doesn't make them, you know, more um, emboldened to be violent. Like it literally shows them that you're an older human, (laughs) you're a bigger human, you're a more powerful, stronger human, but you're just a human. Um, But again, I was not raised like that. They were, they were God. I mean, they really were my higher power. Were, is this, is this, I mean, were you raised like similar to the way you're parenting or was it different for you? I, let me think. I mean, without getting into, you know, like every family, there's, there's different, sure. <laughs> there's different, there's different uh, varieties and there's different aspects of mine. But um, I think to your point with your parents and my parents, it's so much based in control, you know, like um, if I can do this, if, you know, if, if we do this, if we put on this image, we can control the narrative. I can, if I let, if I force you to think this certain way, if I don't allow you the freedom to question, or if I don't allow you, then we're going to stay in this safe space. Cause once we go over those parameters, that's being out of control and that's too scary. Um, and me as a parent, like I have to go, I'm out of control. So I'm, I, I, I don't have the answers and it feels out of control and all I wanted to protect you. And I don't know. I mean, the social media world right now is, it. it's like, I just have to take a deep breath and go, I, I don't know how to navigate that with a teenager. I don't. And I mean, I do, I try to, but it, it talk about the wild, wild West. I don't, I don't know. It feels out of control. And I have to sit in that uncertain, uncontrolled space and go, God, I'm going to surrender that to you. I, I mean, I, I, I envy know. I envy my religious friends and family for whom it is not an option. And I know that's not necessarily the solution for everyone. But, yeah, I have family and they really don't consume media. It's like a whole other thing. And, um, you know, it's definitely something that I, I wish sometimes I could just make it go away. Um, here's an interesting question. Is your daughter asthmatic? She's not. Can you imagine... <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering, like, was that a concern of yours? You know, did you ever think like, oh, my gosh, what would that be like if she is asthmatic? I mean, do you think about how, you you know, do you see your parents differently, you know, in dealing with you when you became a parent thinking about that? Yeah, I it's so funny. Not the asthma for me. Um, I think it's um, 
it's other it's other stuff for me because I mean there's something about the asthma that I feel like there's been so many developments and I the management of it I think I could somewhat handle. It's more the emotional of dealing with rejection, that kind of stuff. It's more dealing one day when somebody does you know just she does go through that or she goes through these heartbreaks or she you know just stuff like that happens in life and you know like us you and i deal with crap and she's gonna have her own crap it's that kind of stuff that i have to um realize i'm powerless and uh be with her um and just hopefully be a helper to her you know because you know the, the crazy thing is when when i not crazy when i see a child speaking of asthma when i see a child who has asthma there is this just like oh i you just want to hug them like i get it i get it and there's such power when you have or even anxiety panic attacks when i find out someone's had a panic attack or is going through a panic attack it's just like just to be there and be like hey listen this is going to pass i know it feels like it's not that is power that kind of understanding and empathy and to be that helper to them. And I hope I'm the same helper to her when she goes through that. But I dread that day. <laughs> I dread that day because if it's a stranger, I can have that somewhat of a disconnect. When it's your daughter, it's like, God, give me the strength, you know? So awesome um, just to talk to you. You have such an interesting, you know, lens on on all these different, you know, kind of things that that all somehow combine, you know? Um, it comes from so much pain. <laughs> right. <laughs> I get it. Um, you, you have some really exciting projects coming up, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of talk about whatever you want us to, to look out for. I mean, the Being the Ricardos sounds absolutely incredible. Yeah, it's a beautiful film. It just sounds like such an amazing thing to be part of. And also, you're the villain in Clifford the Big Red Dog. Is that correct? I'm I am, super I am. into Clifford I'm the Big Red Dog. Yeah. Is that a live yeah. action movie? It is a live action movie. And it's, um, I don't know if you had the chance to see it because, uh, yeah, no, there's be no reason for you to go see it. But it's, um, it's a really, it's, I don't know if you've worked with kind of live action animation, but I thought you were going to say, I don't know if you've worked with a big red dog before. <laughs> cause man, cause man, it is <laughs> astonishing. No, it is uh, just what they can do. I don't even, even talking about it. I feel like such an idiot because it baffles me how they can take a big red dog, <laughs> make him run through the New York, <laughs> run through New York, it real fur, like this dog. <laughs> you're just like, what the, I don't, I don't even get it. And I, even when someone explains it to me, I don't get it. So I have a lot of admiration for all those people. It's crazy. And you first published your first children's book in 2014. And then it was turned into an animated series, correct, for mm -hmm. Netflix. Yeah. Um, can you tell us just, you know, again, for people who don't know about it, can you just tell us what that is so people can look for that as well? Because I think it's really, really cool. Oh, thanks. I really love it <laughs> i okay so the book was called archibald's next big thing and it kind of came from that being present thing and it's about this little chicken who gets his card in the mail that says your big thing is here and he's like where and he goes on all these adventures but every time he's on an adventure he's like i gotta get to my next big thing and this bee comes along and the bee's like you gotta just be man you gotta just be and then in the end he realizes that his big thing really is here like my big thing is talking to you right now that's my big thing my big thing is not somewhere else and so with the series, Archibald, the chicken, now sees everything like it's a big thing. He has, and it's like, he sees the best in everybody. He sees the, the just, he sees the best in humanity and situations. And when I tell you this chicken for a good four years was my role model. Like I just, just not even, positive isn't even saying it enough. Just the fact of gravitating to characters that maybe other people forgot and seeing the best in those characters um, when when there was a label put on a character, he saw beyond that. It was like, no, what's going on? Like, just that kind of perspective towards life was so great. And I love this chicken. I love this chicken. I'm going to ask, why a chicken? Why a chicken? Good question. I was at an L.A. art show years ago before the book, and I met this guy named Victor Huckabee, and he had sketched Archibald, and Archibald was named after his great uncle i think and i was a big fan of beaker on the muppet of show of course i mean who was i loved it? beaker i know and he 
the shape of his head reminded yeah. me of Beaker. And also yellow is my favorite color. I'm yep. See, there show, he is. The and there's the bee. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I just gravitated to this character and I had to start a conversation with, with him and we became friends and started talking about doing a children's book. And then my friend Tony Biagni joined us and that's where the book came about. That's super awesome. That's really, really cool. This has been so much fun. I do have um, two more quick questions. The first one doesn't need to be quick, but like I'm going to say something really weird, but I think you get it. Um, you seem very normal. And what, what I mean is, you know, I've been in Hollywood my, you know, since I'm 11 years old and, you know, kind of actively on the sitcom circuit and, you know, since I was about 14 and I'm, you know, quite a bit older now. Um, you know, you meet a lot of lovely people and you mm -hmm. meet a lot of um, very, very successful people. And um, there's often, you know, a very kind of, there's a, a kind of veneer, you know, around them. And I, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. Mm -hmm. I just mean there's, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of distance, you know, that, that m many people in our industry do kind of keep. But, um, you know, talking to you, it, um, you, you don't seem to, ha like, you're, you're very open. You're very kind of vulnerable. Do you, um, I mean, do you attribute that to anything in particular? Is that just kind of like who you are? I mean, you know what I mean? Like we've seen each yeah, other at the Emmy Awards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lost the year you won, you know? Um, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. you know, there's, there's definitely like, there's a, there's a vibe that I don't mm. get from you. And I just, it's really lovely. It's nice. And I'm just Thank curious you. if you think about that, if you know about it, you know, uh, I do know what you're talking about in terms of that veneer. I really try hard. It's really, it's a real challenge to not, I'm sure you experienced this too, to not judge it. Cause it's, it's, um, it's, I just, cause I have to recognize, you know, not to get too into it, but I remember doing this character years ago and the character was such a douchebag and so manipulative and so full of himself. And, and I was like, ugh. I hate people like this. I really am not, we don't want to do this character. And this acting teacher said, Diane Castle, she said, um, you have to realize that's inside of you. Yeah. And the truth is, I have had arrogant moments in my life, many. I have been manipulative. I have been have moments of being a douchebag. And I'm trying lately to really try and see myself in other people because it's really hard because <laughs> I want to just be like, anyways, but to answer your question, I. I do see that. And I have weirdly, not weirdly, I think there is faith associated. I know there's faith associated with this. There's this, there's this perspective that I have, of, not in a dark way, but I just kind of many times find myself just going, again, we are spinning on a planet. This is fleeting. You know, people that won an Oscar 10 years ago, some of them are dead. You know, it's, it's like, and it's, it's forgotten. And that kind of is always tends to be, and when I meet somebody who I want to immediately judge, there's a part of me that wants to go up to them and say, hey, man, you're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die. We're all going to die. And your legacy is that you were a douchebag. <laughs> That's your legacy. What a, what a bummer. What an absolute I have so many people I want to play this for. I'll be like, listen to Tony Hill. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a bummer. And the thing is, you actually can make today a different choice to start treating people differently. And you can change your legacy. You can change your legacy. And I don't do that because I don't think, I really don't think that would make a difference if I said that because I think that would, they're probably not in a place to receive it. But I have to remember that. Like, you know, what am I giving importance and what is stuff that's really going to have longevity? And that tends to, and again, I follow the time. I have moments of arrogance. I have moments of entitlement, all that crap. But it's like, I have to wake, this therapist one time said to me, he said, you have to wake yourself up a hundred times a day to where you are. And it's like, because many times that what ifs and narratives go all different kinds of places. And it's like, you know what? And he also says, um, activate the five senses. Like, what are you hearing, smelling, seeing, touching, tasting? And it's like, I have to just kind of activate those just to ground myself because I'll be somewhere else. Anyways, massive tangent that was. <laughs> no, it's been such a delight. I wish I could hug you. Like, I really. I, I know. I mean, I the, this I is this is a really, really, this is a really significant conversation. I'm so grateful to you for talking to us. And thank oh, you so, it. so much. Do you know what? Not to plug. Not Please to do. Plug, all, plug away. I'm, I'm, I'm plugging because I believe in this and I feel like it really 
it really speaks into what we're talking about. The show that I'm doing, I'm starting to shoot it again in January. It's called the Mysterious Benedict Society. Mm-hmm. And the first season talks so much about the noise of society and the truth rising above that. And this one character, Benedict, gathers these kids because he sees something unique in them. He sees empathy. He sees, you know, these kids don't have superpowers, but their superpower is their intelligence, their creativity, their empathy. And that's what brings change. And I feel like we are in a town where it's your... You know, it's your resume, it's your talent, it's all this kind of stuff. That's what showcases you. But it's like the power is in the empathy, how you're seeing people, how we treat people on set. You know, the truth rising above the noise. And so, like, I'm really, I love this show and I do love to talk about it. So So awesome. Thank you so much. Golly gee, that was an extremely delightful, delightful conversation. And... I happen to have not been alone in the studio. Obviously, we have Scott here, who's always with me. Um, But we actually have Erin, fine. (laughs) She is fine, Um, who works with us um, at Mind Bialik's Breakdown. And I thought we would slide her in here for our conclusion. Um, Erin handles a smattering of things, so many things. She's the merch person. She's kind of our social media liaison. Um, And you also have asthma. I do. Did you identify in particular with some of the asthma stuff? Very much. Actually, when I found out that asthma was going to be discussed, the first thing I thought about was, I wonder if some connection between panic attacks and asthma is going to be discussed, because I don't hear that very often, and that's a, a kind of a theme in my life. So I was blown away when he brought that up. Had you had asthma also as a child? It, at five is when it developed. Wow. And, and it was kind of a scary experience for me, too. And do you manage it now with an inhaler? Do you have an inhaler that you... I do. So, oh my gosh, there were so many things I resonated with. But I also, the when I leave the house, the first thing I think about is, do I have my inhaler? Or, you know, what pocket can I put it in? Does my purse, you know, I can, not a tiny clutch, I have to fit my inhaler, you know, which I think asthmatics can really relate to. But in terms of management, it's gotten better as I've gotten older. It's gotten better um, in terms of understanding my diet. Mm. It's gotten better because I understood the connection to allergies, mm. which you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so managing allergies changed my relationship with asthma in a major way. Well, and also a lot of mental health stuff that we talk about here relates to the immune system, you know, and, you know, this is one of those mind body connection moments where, you know, the the kind of baseline that we have can hurt our immune system and our ability to fight off simple allergens that otherwise we might be able to process. So it's kind of it's this, you know, it's a it's a cycle. It's a kind of snake eating its own tail um, thing. But um, he's just, I mean, Tony is, I, it's kind of like, I, I want to read the things he's read. I want to go to the places that he's gone. Like, he sounds so, what words did you say? Like, grounded? So much wisdom. Very wise So human. articulate. So willing to be open and vulnerable. So, vul- but not in like a, in a very sincere way. Incredibly sincere and genuine. I just, I really love talking to him. I want to like, I want to be his friend. I love that he kind of also started off with this notion of, like, the things that you think you want. Oh, my gosh. Like, you can you can get them and still like it's it's so not about those things because so many people we we do. We live for that next thing. If I can just do this, if I just have this much money, if I just bought, you know, whatever it is. And I just love that, like the time that he actually entered therapy was at a time when you'd think like he's got it all. Yeah, just really so awesome. Aaron, since Jonathan's not here, can you introduce um, our moments of peace and calm? Usually he says like, Mayam, what's your moment of peace and calm? Mayam, what's your moment of peace and calm? Moment of peace and calm, Mayam realizes something. I had a really good moment of peace and calm amidst a really tumultuous moment, set of moments in my brain. I had a very, very frustrating uh, email exchange with someone who I have, I don't want to say I have, this person and I have a very difficult time communicating. 
whatever it is, like, in the universe. <laughs> I actually had this thought. I'm like, am I secretly in love with her? Like, the emotions that these interactions bring up the only thing that I can compare the intensity to is deep love. So let's just put that aside. But let's just say that the communication was not, you know, it was doing what it does. And it was, and I felt it in my body. I felt what I know is my blood pressure rising. And like, this is, this does not happen a lot. I felt it. It was like my heart and like, you know, the word is palpitations. I don't mean to be clinical, but it was like, it was like, and I felt it like in my throat and I felt rage. Like when you talk about seeing red, I felt like I need to break something. I need to hurt something. Like it was so intense. And I looked at my clock. I had like 20 minutes till I had to be back on set. This was like on my lunch break. I was like catching up and I was like, I just need to like keep hammering out these emails. I'm respond to this one. I'm going to say this and I'm going to point out this and blah. And I literally had a moment that I I couldn't have had if I had one less hour of therapy, one less meeting, one less you know, hug with Jonathan, whatever it was. I just, I spoke to myself, you know, and I said to myself, I didn't say it out loud, not at that point yet, but I said, like, you have a choice right now. You can keep this going for 20 more minutes and carry it through the rest of your work day when you have to be present, happy, remember lines, whatever. It's also very hard to remember lines when my blood pressure is like that. So like I knew, I said, or you can force yourself to shut that computer, just shut it. Nothing else needs to be done right now. And I chose a meditation and I was like, I can't, I can't even focus. But I forced myself to just stay. And I realized I could still feel my heart. And I was like, there is one solution to this and it's my breath. And like at that moment, I was able to summon like all the things, you know, not all, but many things that I've been told, you know? And by 10 minutes, my heart rate had slowed down. Wow. I was still frustrated. Like, I could go back there in a second. But whatever it was, it worked. And I was like, that's a moment of grace. It's a moment of grace because on any other day, I might not have had the patience to do it. Totally. But in that moment, I was able to do it. And I was able to, I don't know if I slept for the other 10 minutes, but I was in a, you know, a quieter space. And sometimes it just takes listening to some other voice, you know, meaning whether it's the voice inside you, whether it's God, whether it's, you know, the meditation, I use Insight Timer. They don't sponsor this show, but they should. Um, you know, I just use the free meditations there and I just listen to that person's voice. And yeah, every time my mind went away, I just, I gently put it back. Um, one of the meditation teachers I like says, it's like when you're training a puppy. You don't need to be mean to the puppy. You don't need to judge the puppy when it goes away. You gently pick it up, you put it back down, and you say, stay. Like, that's what you do with your mind. It was a very special, special moment. Good teaching moment for myself. Thank you, Aaron, for being part of, uh, of this wonderful, wonderful time we had with Tony Hale. You're and so uh, follow us on our Instagram account. Um, at Bialik Breakdown, go to BialikBreakdown.com. That's B-I-A-L-I-K Breakdown.com. Uh, make sure that you are a subscriber to my YouTube channel, which is where you can watch all of the madness go down. And make sure to, to subscribe on Spotify and all the places that you get podcasts. It really does matter. And it really does help make more, um, helps us make more. Uh, all right, from my breakdown to the one that I hope you never have, I'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one And now she's gonna break down.